Hello, and welcome to Stellar Astronomy. This semester, we'll be learning about stars, galaxies, and the entire universe. We'll look at some of the most exotic things ever discovered, like quasars and black holes, and we'll find out how we study these distant objects. I'm Dave Carey from Citrus Community College. And I'm Joanne Eisberg from Chafee Community College. Throughout these notes, we'll be giving you the sort of commentary on the material that we normally give our students in our astronomy classes, though we'll try not to do too many of the bad jokes. Maybe. On almost every page, you'll get to hear us telling you about the material. There are also places where we'll stop and let you stop and work through the ideas yourself or with others in the class. Some of these activities will be graded, and others are just there for practice. We do the same thing in our traditional classrooms as well. You'll also find links here to outside videos, websites, and other things that can give you more information or another way to look at this stuff. If you're not connected to the internet, these links aren't essential. But if you want to see more, they'll help you get deeper into the class material. In this first set of notes, we'll be giving you the big picture. This is our chance to put all of the parts of the universe into context, to see how all of the pieces fit together. We'll try to give you a sense of how big everything is, and introduce some of those terms that you hear all the time in astronomy, like star and galaxy and solar system. If we want to understand the universe, it helps to look at it on three different size scales. The first one is the solar system size scale, our immediate neighborhood. The second one is the stellar scale, the stars and nebulae around us. Lastly, we've got the galactic scale which extends on up to the universe as a whole. Let's start with a solar system. The big idea to appreciate here is that the Earth is a planet. You probably already knew that, but it's good to remember that just a few hundred years ago, if you'd said anything like this, most people would say you were nuts. So what does it mean to say that the Earth is a planet? There are eight planets traveling around the sun, the Earth is the third one out. Since the whole thing is orbiting around the Sun, we call it a solar system. The guy in the picture is Nicholas Copernicus. He wasn't the first person to argue that the Earth is in motion. A number of ancient Greek astronomers had argued for the Earth's orbit, and some medieval Islamic astronomers had considered the Earth's spin. But in science, credit goes to the person who succeeds in convincing a critical mass of other people. In 1543, Copernicus pu published a book that did persuade succeeding generations of astronomers that Earth is a planet orbiting in a sun-centered or heliocentric system. By removing the Earth from the center, Copernicus kicked off a completely new understanding of the universe. At the bottom, you can click on a link to see a modern forensic reconstruction of Copernicus's face. This picture shows us that not all planets are alike. There are some really big ones, like Jupiter and Saturn. Then there are little ones, like Venus and Mars. The Earth is in there with the little ones. In fact, it's the biggest little planet in the solar system, just like Reno. You should notice a couple of other things in this picture, too. Down along the bottom, it shows dwarf planets. This is a fairly new category, and it refers to things that are really too small to count as planets. Take a look at the big glowing thing on the left. That's the sun. Notice how big it is compared to the planets. About 99.8% of the solar system is the sun. What's that last 0.2%? Almost all of that is just two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, the Sun is a star, so we won't spend a lot of time in this course talking about it, since it's covered in detail in our Stellar Astronomy course. Besides the planets and dwarf planets, there are lots of still smaller things orbiting the Sun, like comets and asteroids. The biggest of them can be as big as a large U.S. state, but most are much smaller than that. These pictures show two views of comets. On the left is the more familiar one a glowing cloud of gas and dust, often with a long tail, sitting in the night sky. But most of a comet's mass is the small, 
city-sized chunk of ice and rock that you see on the right. It's only when comets get close to the sun that they spew out all that gas and dust that we see in the picture on the left. This picture shows a set of asteroids, including the largest one yet visited by a spacecraft, Vesta. Vesta is around 300 miles or 500 kilometers across. The other ones are shown to scale, including Itakawa, the tiny dot indicated by the long line near the bottom. Itakawa is less than one mile across, so small you may not even see it on your screen at all. There are probably millions of asteroids and billions of icy bodies that could form comets in our solar system. Even though there are such huge numbers of them, they're still only a very tiny part of the total amount of material orbiting the Sun. Small bodies are scattered around many parts of the solar system, but there are a few special regions where these bodies are concentrated. Most of the asteroids in our solar system are in a band orbiting the Sun between the orbits of the planets Mars and Jupiter. This is roughly twice as far from the Sun as the Earth. On the other hand, comets mostly originate in two distinct regions in the outer reaches of our solar system. The first of these is called the Kuiper Belt. This is a band like the asteroid belt, but located just outside of the orbit of Neptune, the outermost planet we know of. The other home region for comets is the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a much larger region that surrounds the rest of our solar system in a spherical shell, far outside of where the planets and the Kuiper Belt are located. In fact, the Oort Cloud probably extends a significant fraction of the distance to the next solar system. So far, we've talked about objects that orbit the Sun. But moons are different. They orbit planets, asteroids, and other smaller Sun orbiters. There are over 150 known moons in the solar system. Don't ask me how many. I stopped counting when they started finding them by the dozen around some planets. You can see some of the moons here. The Earth is fairly boring with just one moon. Jupiter has four big moons and many smaller ones not shown in this picture. In fact, all four of the big outer solar system planets have a huge number of moons. This picture shows at least one asteroid with a moon, and a couple of dwarf planets have them too. Having a moon is not enough to qualify an object as a planet. On the other hand, notice that not all planets have a moon. Can you identify the two planets that are missing from this list because they don't? Did you figure out which ones are missing? It's Mercury and Venus. Notice that a few of these moons really stand out as being nearly planet-sized. The Earth's moon is one of those. So are the four big moons of Jupiter and the largest moons of Saturn and Neptune. When we start looking at the planets in detail, we'll study their moons, especially the bigger ones as well. These big moons are shaped by a lot of the same things as the planets, so it makes sense to cover them at the same time. Finally. Even though there are all of these planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, comets, moons, and other little objects, our solar system is still mostly empty space. One way to look at that is to consider distance. Our Earth is about 93 million miles, or 150 million kilometers from the Sun. Astronomers call this distance an astronomical unit. Neptune, the outermost planet, is about 30 times farther. 30 astronomical units, or about 4.5 billion kilometers away. Notice, folks, that's billion with a B, not just million with an M. Have a look at this image. It's a set of pictures of our solar system, taken from just beyond the orbit of Neptune. Each little gray square is a separate picture. You can't see the actual planets in those images, but there are letters showing where they're located. The boxes beside them show highly magnified views of each of the planets that were visible. They couldn't take a picture of the Sun. It was too bright, even at this distance. And Mars and Mercury were too close to the Sun. But have a look at that little dot marked Earth. If you were alive in 1990, you're in that picture. So are all of the other 5.5 billion people 
who were around at that time.